All right. Good morning. How, are, how is everybody? Thank you so much for being here this morning. My name is Kathy Scott. I am a true crime author and a journalist by trade, and I am your moderator. Um, about the Golden State Killer for a decade beginning in 1976 and ending in 1986, one of America's most horrific and prolific serial predators, the Golden State Killer, blazed a trail of terror up and down the state of California, from Sacramento to Orange County. At least 45 rapes and 12 murders were mostly committed during residential burglaries. The perpetrator, also known as the East Area Rapist, has been described by the FBI as a 5 foot 10 white male who today would be between 60 and 75 years old. He had blonde or light brown hair, an athletic build, and may have had military training. He often took small items from homes, including coins, cash, ID cards, and jewelry. In 2016, the FBI, along with local law enforcement, announced a $50,000 reward and launched a national campaign to help identify the Golden State Killer. With us today is a remarkable panel, including three brave women, who will talk about their personal experiences that involve the Golden State Killer. First, Jane Carson Sand Sandler is a native of New Jersey. After graduating from nurses training in Newark, she joined the <clears throat> excuse me, the USAF Nurse Corps in 1969. Serving her country for 30 years on both active and reserve duty, in 1999 she retired as a full colonel. Jane earned a bachelor's degree in nursing at California State University and her master's in human resources management at Pepperdine University. In 2014, her book was published about the East Area Rapist titled Frozen in Fear. Jane is happily married and has two wonderful sons. Michelle Cruz is the sister of 18-year-old Janelle Cruz, the last known murder victim at the, of the Golden State Killer. Michelle spends much of her time researching persons of interest and interviewing and working with law enforcement. She is an advocate for the Golden State Killer cases and for many of the victims who are still too afraid to speak out. Her goal is to bring more attention to the cases and ultimately identify the perpetrator. Uh, when Debbie Domingo was 15 years old, her mother was brutally murdered by the serial perpetrator known as the Golden State Killer. Initially, the murders of Sherry Domingo and her boyfriend, Greg Sanchez, were thought to be linked to other murders in this series but that was not confirmed until a DNA match was obtained in 2011. Now, over 30 years after her mother's killing, Debbie spends much of her time working to raise public awareness about this still unsolved case. Michelle Cruz is the sister of 18-year-old Janelle Cruz, the last known murder victim of the Golden State Killer. Michelle spends much of her time, oh, I already did that one, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> You're not speaking twice. Um, okay, Debbie. Mike Morford is a true crime researcher and blogger from New Jersey who has spent more than a decade hunting California's Zodiac Killer. He has now taken on the Golden State Killer case. All right. Jane, as a survivor, can you talk about the crime and the in attack's impact on your life and your journey since? no room for my computer here okay oh gosh wow this audience is truly amazing I am very emotional this morning I want you all to know um, but I just want to start by thanking you all for coming thanking you all for caring and I can tell by the look on your faces that you're interested in our stories and you want to help us identify the crazed, deranged, psychotic maniac who degraded, humiliated, controlled, manipulated, and dominated 
so many victims during his 10-year crime spree. This monster raped 50 women, and he'd murdered 12 others. My name is Jane Carson Sandler, and I was victim number five. My colleagues to my left, Debbie and Michelle, were also his victims, but in a different sense. They will um, tell you their stories, but uh, first I want you to know how I went from being a victim to a survivor to a thriver. To start, can you imagine laying in bed and it's 6.30 in the morning, I was with my three-year-old son and I heard <clears throat> someone running down the hall, shining a flashlight in my face, wearing a ski mask and holding a large butcher knife. And he was holding that knife to my throat and his first words out of his clenched teeth were, shut up or I'll kill you. He quickly gagged me, blindfolded me, and he tied my wrist and ankles very tight with shoelaces. And he proceeded to do the same thing to my three-year-old son. Now I was under his complete control with no way to defend myself and no way to know what he was going to do next. Now that's fear, my friends. That's why I named my book Frozen in Fear. Well, I was hoping he was just there to rob me, but when he untied my ankles, I knew he had something else in mind. I honestly don't remember much about the rape, just the sheer terror of no longer feeling my three-year-old next to me. What did he do to him? Where did he put him? And that's all I could think about. And to add to that fear, the rapist started tearing sheets over and over again, or towels, sheets and towels. And I had no idea what he was planning, what he was contemplating to do with those. And I thought, well, what's he gonna do now? Is he gonna hang us? What's the deal with the, the tearing of the sheets? So then he went and kept going into the kitchen, rattling pots and pans, and every time he left to go in the kitchen or go around the house, he'd come back and he'd say to us the same thing. If I hear anything, I'll come back and I will kill you. Well, he eventually put my son back next to me on the bed, and after I didn't hear any sounds in the kitchen, I was able to get my blindfold down and I saw that my son was asleep next to me. We were able to escape through the back patio door because he had propped up a chair under the front door. Thank God we survived. Looking back, so many of us were the victims of this hideous crime. And um, so many of us, the sheriff's department who relentlessly tried to find him, the entire Sacramento community who lived in fear of a possible attack, our family and friends who shared our grief, and personally, I remained a victim for years, allowing him to control me. I went on with my life bearing my shame and my feelings of anger, hate, fear, and revenge that I had toward him, and it eventually made me physically and emotionally ill. I was divorced eventually, and then I dealt with a disease of alcoholism. But I am happy to say that in July, I will celebrate 14 years of sobriety. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank God. Praise the Lord. So about six years ago, my life really changed for the better, as I really started to deal with my issues. I read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. And I realized that God did have a purpose for me to use my experience in a positive manner to help other women, to pay it forward, to make my mess a message, and turn my pain into power. I began by facilitating a weekly group to help survivors of rape and incest at our local rape crisis center. And then I began to speak to different women's group and also in prisons. Then God put a pen in my hand and he said, you got to write a book. And uh, I said, God, I'm a nurse. 
I'm not an author. He said, write. I said, okay, all right. So I did. And uh, then writing helped me heal. And I eventually had to, believe it or not, I had to forgive, which took a great deal of time and, and prayer to forgive the rapist. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering, do I think he's still alive? And my answer is yes, I do. Michelle, and Debbie, and Mike, and all of us that have been brutally affected by this psychopath, we want closure. We want this case to be put to bed. So fear of his return can forever be erased from our minds. So you folks can help our dream come true by reading everything that you can about this prolific serial rapist and killer who has never been caught and could be your next door neighbor. God bless all of you and thanks for being here. Thank you, Jane. She's amazing, they all are. Thank you so much. Michelle, could you share with us about how you learned your sister Janelle's, about your sister Janelle's murder, your challenges since, and your role in her criminal investigation? Hi, my name is Michelle, and thank you all for coming here today to our panel and listening to our stories. It means so much to us. This has been a really long journey for me, and I'm sure for the other victims and family members affected by the East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer. My journey started on May 6, 1986, when I was working in Mammoth Mountain with my boyfriend and a bunch of friends. I was having the time of my life. I was working on the mountain for the ski season. I lived in the employee dorms, just steps away from the main lodge. It was the heaviest snow season in years, and being I was an employee for the mountain, I was able to ski every day. But on one day, May 6, 1986, my life would be forever changed. I took a call from a friend who lived in Irvine near our family home, and she said, I think you need to sit down because I have something to tell you. And I said, what? And she said, your sister got murdered. And I said, my sister got married. She said, no, murdered. From that point on, I don't remember the rest of the conversation or hanging up the phone. I barely remember what happened for the next 20 years. However, I do remember being interviewed one time by the police. I remember living in hotels and friends' houses. I rem remember moving back east and then coming back to California on my own to finish high school at 17 and be with my friends. Unfortunately, our family unit had been shattered. Our home was sold, and we never went back there again. The East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer, prevailed in destroying our lives. For many years, Janelle's murder, for many years after Janelle's murder, we had different suspicions as to who killed her, but nothing solid. Now, 30 years later, it's the same thing, no solid lead. We have m many persons of interest, but no name to the person responsible for brutally tying her up, raping and bludgeoning her to death beyond recognition. But the one thing that we do have is DNA. Thank God for DNA. The thing that truly haunts and gives me nightmares for years is the thought of how this killer snuck up on her inside of our home and the thought of the struggle of how she fought for her life. Janelle was 18 years old, and she had the, her whole life ahead of her. She could have had a beautiful life with a family of her own. There were many years of her life in which she rebelled due to our abusive stepfather, but she had overcome many of the negative things in her past and put them behind her. She was excited about going to college, getting married one day, and having a family. She had dreams and aspirations. But on May 5th, 1986, all that ended for her. The Golden State Killer took it from her and from me and our entire family. She went from being so happy one minute to being tied up, raped, and murdered. That's it. She was gone. The vision has haunted me for 30 years. 
The fact that the East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer, is still walking free while 62 victims are dead or living in fear is unacceptable. There are all the family members, friends, law enforcement, media, social media, and thousands of others affected by the Golden State Killer. He should not be walking free. He needs to be caught and brought to justice. In 2010, I was asked by a friend to join in on conversations through the internet, pro boards about this killer, and hear theories and express my own thoughts about the case. I am thankful to my friend who introduced me to these boards because it has started me on my new journey, advocating for my sister and the other victims in the hopes of identifying the Golden State Killer. Last year, I started my YouTube channel. Honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. The one thing I did know was that I had a new passion and an overwhelming pull within myself to start waking up this case. It was March 2016 when I posted my first video, showing myself to anyone who would watch and listen. I had to put all my fears to the side, not knowing if one day I could be a target. My goal was to reach as many people as possible and tell them about the East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer, because so many people had not heard of him, and this case needed attention. We needed the one lead that would solve it. The FBI did a press conference in June of last year, and then I started sending letters to different media outlets. One year later, I'm here telling my story, thanks to our friend, Mike Morford, who brought CrimeCon to my attention. It has been a long journey, but this last year has been very productive. It has been great meeting my sister survivors, working with different media outlets, social media, web sleuths, law enforcement, and making new friends. But overall, it's been a very healing experience. This case is finally getting the attention it has always needed. My sister was the closest person to me. Thankfully, on our last conversation, we told each other I love you before we hung up the call. She is now looking down and proud of us all. May her soul rest easy knowing we will get him. His days are numbered. DNA is catching up to him. He will be brought to justice. In closing, I want to say thank you again for showing support in this case by being here and listening to all of us share our stories. Just know that our main goal is exposure and catching this killer who is still walking amongst us. Please talk about this case with people you know who haven't heard of this most prolific serial offender. Help us identify a killer and may justice prevail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Debbie, tell us about your personal experience as a survivor of a murder victim and your determination that the killer be caught. Thank you. My sister survivor, Michelle, just told you about her last conversation with her sister, Janelle. I wish I could say something similar, something heartwarming. When I was 15 years old, I was on the phone arguing with my mother. The last words I screamed at her were, why don't you just stay out of my life? And I hung up the phone. The next day, the bodies were discovered. If heaven had a mailbox, this is what I would write. Dear mom, I really need you to know how grateful I am for the terrific memories I have of my childhood and the solid foundation of faith you gave me. I remember that when I was little, I always felt safe, well cared for, loved. I grew up surrounded by close family, Jesus, music, the ocean, things many people take for granted. In fact, before you were killed, I don't think I ever experienced anything traumatic in my whole life. Okay, a bee sting, having to flush a dead goldfish. <laughs> no pain, really. <laughs> okay, I'll admit, when you and Dad divorced when I was 12, that was a little tough to take. But we dealt with it. 
no trauma to speak of. It was life. And even in those last couple of years, when it seemed all you and I did was scream hateful things at each other, even then, Mom, I always knew that you loved me, and I hope you know I never stopped loving you. The day you and Greg were killed, beaten to death by an intruder in our home, that day was the beginning of the darkest days of my life, about 7,300 dark days, if my math is right. It wasn't so much the specific events of that day, I barely remember those. It was that from that point on, everything changed. My day-to-day -day life changed, my worldview, even my idea of faith changed. There was so much I never got to finish with you, so much I never got to make right. But that day, I got to the house, and the first thing that caught my eye was the yellow tape, that damned yellow police tape, the kind that says, crime scene, do not enter. The fine print on that should say, look out, don't go in. It's so gruesome inside, you'll be scarred for life if you see it. The even finer print should say, but wait, if you don't go in, you'll always question, how messy was it? Everybody knows what yellow tape says. Let me tell you what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, oops, they're gone, you missed your chance to say goodbye. The tape doesn't certainly offer any words of comfort, like, well, at least they were together when they went. It also doesn't tell you which items inside will be cleaned up and returned to you, or which ones you'll never see again. So you'll always wonder, were they taken into evidence? Or did the killer take them? Does he still have them? Does he reflect on them as a twisted reminder of his torturous deeds in that house? I've spent the past 35 years wishing I had never seen that damned yellow tape, that it was all a bad dream, but no. The first 20 years, I'll admit, the image haunted me, but now it fuels me. Today, the sight of yellow tape anywhere reminds me that inside a crime scene, evidence gets collected and analyzed, and we now have data that can identify the monster who bludgeoned you and Greg to death. His DNA is on file can't change that. Today, yellow tape assures me that there are investigators, both paid and unpaid, thousands of them, who are looking for this guy, who won't ever stop looking for him. Now, in my mind, the image of yellow tape serves as a big caution warning to your killer, the Golden State Killer. He better look out. His face and secrets cannot stay hidden forever. These days, for me, the image of yellow tape has transformed into a, a sort of yellow ribbon. It reminds me to honor your memory. But I don't really need much reminding. I think about you and Greg every day. I miss you both. And I think about the others as well. I think of Brian and Katie Maggiore, of Robert Offerman and Deb Manning, of Lyman and Charlene Smith, of Keith and Patty Harrington of Manuela Whithewn, and of course, of Janelle Cruz. I can picture all of you, you know, your smiles. Your smiles have been immortalized by the handful of photos that have been shared over and over again by sleuths. Your faces are etched into the minds of those who seek justice on your behalf. In my dark moments, in my nightmares, I can picture you and Greg, the anguish, the physical pain, the terror of your last moments face to face with that monster. And fortunately for me, those glimpses are fleeting. In my waking, working hours, I can see and feel your strength, your optimism, your inner joy. Mom, those are the gifts that you left me and they are what motivate and guide me every day. I need to assure you Mom, we are going to find this guy. With the public's help, we will find him, even if he's already dead. For the ones like Jane, who survived his attacks and lived looking over their shoulders for the past 40 years, they deserve peace. We're going to end that reign of terror for them. For you and Greg and the others like you, whose beautiful young lives were stolen by a madman, you deserve justice. 
he's going to be held accountable for you. And for Michelle and I and the other survivors who have nothing but loose ends and memories, we deserve answers. We deserve to know the truth about what happened. And we're going to get it. I promise, Mom, we're going to get him. Love you. Deb. Thank you so much, Debbie. Mike, can you tell us about your knowledge of the killer, along with the serial murders he's committed, and offer pointers for the audience on how to be helpful in an investigation? Um, let me start off by saying how lucky I am to be on stage with these remarkable, brave women um, that aren't living in fear, but instead are bravely working to identify this Golden State Killer, AKA East Area Rapist, AKA Original Night Stalker. There's currently a $50,000 reward offered in this case. This offender is California's worst prolific serial offender and killer credit with at least a dozen murders, 50 rapes, and perhaps more than 100 home break-ins and burglaries. From 1976 to 1986, this man made his way from Sacramento, Sacramento in Northern California to Irvine in Southern California, leaving a trail of havoc and victims along the way. Our hope today is that sharing all the information we can about him with those of you in the true crime community will help shine a much needed light on this monster and spread the word about this case. Social media may be a great way to help bring awareness to this case and there are possible sketches, voice recordings, and writing samples of his that can be shared by a social media. Maybe somebody will be able to identify him this way. Here are some things that are known about him as far as MO. This perp is known to have spent days and weeks stalking his victims and their homes. In multiple cases, he made prank and heavy breathing calls to his victims, both before and after the attacks. His attacks came mostly late at night or early in the daylight hours, ending before sunrise. This may be a clue to what kind of employment or job schedule he had. There's evidence that this attacker visited and gained entry to his victims' homes prior to his attacks on them. In some cases, he would leave windows or doors unlocked, leaving bindings hidden in the home for use in his future attacks and unloading any firearms the victims might own that they might try to defend themselves with. Evidence suggests that this perp may have had access to multiple vehicles, and in some cases it's possible that he may have worked with an accomplice, as there were instances when car horns outside of the victim's home would be blown during the attacks, or somebody outside would knock, or a female voice even could be heard talking at sometimes. This attacker would do blitz-style attacks, gaining entry into the house and waking his victims with a flashlight shining in their eyes. These women would be tightly bound and then raped. During the attacks, he would threaten them with death while wielding a knife or a gun, and he always wore a mask. Early on, this perpetrator seemed to only target women that were alone, but that eventually changed and he started to attack couples. He would force the female victim to tie up the male victim, then separate the couples. He would stack plates on the back of the male victims and tell them that if he heard those plates fall, that he would kill them. During the attacks, he would leave the victims bound and would sometimes wander off to their kitchen or refrigerator, taking their food and eating it. He would ransack their home looking for small trinkets and jewelry and would often take things that were more of a sentimental value as opposed to a high dollar value. In many cases, the victims that he attacked were living in or nearby homes that were for sale. It's a possibility that he may have visited open houses posing as a buyer or an agent while he actually was casing and surveying property and victims. In some attacks, he left bindings behind, and on some of these bindings, he had tied very distinctive and difficult to tie diamond knots. In many attacks, he used shoelaces. As far as physical features and clues, he was described as average height, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10, most cases with a thin athletic build. His eyes were described as light colored, possibly blue, green, or hazel. During this series, he seemed to be quite athletic, outrunning pursuers, jumping fences, and racing away on bicycles in an effort not to be caught. One distinct physical feature noted by many victims was an extremely small or unusually small penis. This may have been due to a medical issue or a disease. Some victims described him as having a possible stutter, and nearly all of the victims described him as talking through clenched teeth. In multiple instances, tracking dogs that were tasked with following his scent and escape route 
started to act erratically, which led investigators to speculate that the rapist may have been a heavy drug user or had a medical condition or disease that caused the behavior in the dogs. Regarding the timeline of this killer, his first confirmed attacks were in June 1976 in Rancho Cordova area of Sacramento County in Northern California. Later, he would move down to other towns in Sacramento. During this series, he was known locally as the East Area Rapist as he seemed to target victims that were located in the eastern part of the county. He targeted Sacramento exclusively until 1978. In 1978, this series continued in six other counties in Northern California, including San Joaquin, Yola, Contra Costa, Stanislaus, Alameda, and Santa Clara counties. His last attack in Northern California was in July of 1979. Three months later, in October of 1979, he attacked in Goleta, Santa Barbara County in Southern California. In that case, the couple he chose to attack foiled his plans and both escaped from their home, leaving this perpetrator to abort his attack and flee the scene. Less than two months later, in December of 1979, he once, attacked, he once again attacked in Goleta, this time murdering his victims, Dr. Robert Offerman and Deborah Manning. In March of 1980, he attacked and murdered Lyman and Charlene Smith in Ventura, about 40 miles southeast of Goleta. In August of 1980, this monster attacked in Dana Point in southern Orange County, more than 100 miles from his previous murder killing, his murders, killing Keith and Patrice Harrington. In February of 1981, he once again struck in Orange County in the town of Irvine, murdering Manuel Whithoom. In July of 1981, the killer went back to Goleta, attacking and murdering Debbie's mom, Sherry, and Sherry's boyfriend, Greg Sanchez. After a long break, this perpetrator was not heard from again until May of 1986, when he struck for the final time back in Irvine, killing Michelle's sister, Janelle, only a couple miles from his previous Irvine murder. In all the murders, this predator either shot or bludgeoned his victims to death. During these unsolved Southern California attacks, this perpetrator was dubbed the Night Stalker. His crimes began before the well-known Richard Ramirez Night Stalker murders, making this murder the original Night Stalker. Why the pause in activity? Was he in prison? Did he have a life-changing event, such as a marriage or birth of a child? It's not unheard of for serial killers to go dormant for years, as we've seen with killers like BTK. In the 1990s, science confirmed what many investigators felt in their gut already, when DNA linked the Northern California crimes with the Southern California crimes. The East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker were one and the same, and investigators began referring to him as Eurons. Not a very catchy name. For simplicity's sake, we now use the name given to this killer by the late true crime writer Michelle McNamara, the Golden State Killer. In recent years, police have added two more murders to this killer's total. Brian and Katie Maggiore, a young Air Force couple who were gunned down while walking their dog in Rancho Cordova in February 1978. Since Brian was in the military, the Maggiore murders would wind up becoming a federal investigation, thus allowing the FBI to become involved. What happened to this man after 1986? We don't know. He may have died or went to prison or he may still be alive out there someplace walking freely. Once again, we're talking about a man that committed a dozen murders, 50 rapes, and perhaps 100 break-ins or home burglaries. Sadly, due to the statute of limitations, if this offender is identified, he can't be punished for the rapes or burglaries. But there is no statute of limitations on murder. And honestly, what these victims and survivors really search for is the truth. With your help, we, can, we will be able to give these three women with me today, as well as all the other victims and families whose lives ended or were disrupted at the hands of this coward, the answers and justice they deserve. One last note, some investigators feel that this perpetrator may have started out as the Visalia Ransacker, an offender that was responsible for dozens of home burglaries and break-ins from 1973 to 1975 in Visalia, California, prior to the East, Ac East Area Sacramento rapes. Please stop by our booth if you'd like to ask more questions about the case, as well as to take and share case materials that we are handing out. Be sure to visit the relevant websites about this case, and lastly, but most importantly, if you know of any tips you can supply to the FBI, please do so at the FBI tip line that we have included on our materials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, tomorrow night, um, on the case with Paula Zahn, um, these three remarkable, strong women will be on her show. What time is it? 10 o'clock. 10. And 9 Central. 10 Eastern and uh, 9 Central. And on, on the ID channel, Investigation Discovery. And Debbie, can you tell them about the podcast? Yes. Uh, up, up, 
Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is podcast heaven, right? Uh, recent, <laughs> recently, uh, there's an Australian podcast called Case File, and they have done the most thorough coverage of our case that we've ever heard. Uh, just over the past month, they released a five-part series. It, they originally planned on doing four parts, and they had so much material that they extended it. They, uh, they have already released over nine hours of podcasts. So there's uh, part one is two hours, part two is two hours, part three is two hours, and then parts four and five are each an hour and a half. Um, and uh, Michelle... Uh, Jane and Michelle and I were all interviewed uh, for that podcast, as well as several of the key investigators, uh, including the criminologist Paul Holes, who um, is, is really one of our biggest heroes. So uh, if y'all will listen to Case File Podcast, it is their episode number 53, Case File Podcast 53, The East Area Rapist. Thank you so much. So important. We have time for a couple of questions. If um, anybody wants to ask, I can't see you, so I can't. Uh, anybody? Oh, there you are, right there. Okay, I'll repeat the question. If uh, if they have his DNA, but he hasn't um, recommitted, um, how do they match it up? The DNA profile has been run through, near, through absolutely every database in the United States and, and a lot of the worldwide as well. Um, there has been no match, which means that he's never been incarcerated and had a DNA sample taken by any of the, uh, the agencies. Each state has different DNA um, requirements for, for what sampling they do. Um, in California, for instance, uh, as a result of this case, actually, um, California now mandates that anyone arrested for a felony automatically surrenders a DNA sample. Not all states do that. Um, but all states do, whatever DNA samples they have, they submit to CODIS, which is the National DNA Database. So at this point, we've got the DNA profile, but no direct hit on the perpetrator. And so far, we haven't had a familial match either. And that's actually what we're hoping for, is that this perpetrator may have a brother, a son, somebody who uh, we can get a, a familial DNA hit and then connect the dots and trace back and figure out who he is. Thanks so much, Debbie. Thank you. Anybody else? Go. Okay. What is the status of the database and the backlog? Anybody know? Honestly, I don't think any of us have that information. I'm sorry. She's a corrections officer, a by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but not in California. <laughs> but I'm sorry, we don't have that, that, um, that information. It's a good question. We need to look into it. Anyone else? Yeah, so there's, there's been a lot of suspects and persons of interest that have been looked at. Um, many DNA samples have been collected and they just one by one are getting ruled out as not matches. Now back in the 70s when they were first investigating, one thing we didn't talk about was secretor status of this man, um, which I'm not going to go into a long scientific explanation about secretor status, but it was a way they could tell what blood type he was or, or wasn't. He did not secrete something that they could use to determine. So they used that non-secretor status because not many people are a non-secretor he was um, but they ruled out a lot of people with that um, if they were a secretor they were ruled out he was a non-secretor but the problem was later they found out through science that there could be uh, false reads on some of those testings which means they may have cleared suspects that based on that secretor status it may have been ruled out incorrectly so a lot of those Suspects and people that they've looked at earlier are getting retested just for DNA now. They don't care about blood type or any of that stuff. It's strictly DNA. Um, so they're asking for voluntary swabs or collecting DNA and other methods. 
but there are suspects and persons of interest that are getting ruled out one at a time. Great, thanks, Mike. We have time for one more. Um, how did they tie? How did they tie him to the Rancho Cordova shootings to, of the young couple? Go for it. This is bothering me. Does that bother anybody? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't have specific information, but. Uh, we have it on good authority from the law enforcement agencies involved. They, uh, what's been interesting is the last several years, um, all of the departments that have uh, cases in this series are actually now getting to work together, uh, which, you know, everybody says, how come this case wasn't solved? How come they never caught him? How come he kept getting away? Uh, with this perpetrator, he worked in so many different areas that, you know, he'd hit over here in uh, Sacramento and then he'd hit in Concord or Stockton and all these police departments in the 70s, no computers, no cell phones, they didn't talk to each other, so nobody knew. In recent years, these departments are all coming together and, uh, and they're sharing information and um, they now have what they call a working group. FBI is involved and all of the relevant departments. The working group has determined that the majority shootings uh, were, in fact, the work of this perpetrator based on MO, and I'm sure that they've got some kind of holdback evidence that, that is uh, more conclusive than they're telling us. Um, but, um, do you have more? Information That's good. On that? That's, That's good. The, the MO alone, I believe. Oh, yes. And, so, and there were shoelaces found at the scene that were indeed very similar to or maybe even identical to uh, shoelaces that were used in the East Area Rapist attacks. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thank all of you for coming. Share on Facebook, Twitter, re repost um, anything about the serial killer.